You are listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson, exploring biblical prophecy for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Shalom and welcome to Prophet Pearls, recorded live in the city of the prophets, Yerushalayim, Jerusalem, the eternal capital of Israel and the Jewish people. This is Nehemia Gordon, deep down in the basement of the safe house with Keith Johnson. Now, I know, Keith, you don't like my intro. You want me to do the special, previously on Prophet Pearls. <laughs> you want me to do the TV introduction. I'm just trying to, I'm here in the city of the prophets. And yeah, I'm just absolutely. overwhelmed that we're, we're, we're going to be talking about the words of Jeremiah in the very city where, you know, 2,000, what is it, 600 years ago, he preached these words. Mm-hmm. And you want me to do something from law and no, order. No, 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 no. Listen, listen, listen. You, you get your turn. I get my turn. Let's just keep doing this. It is fun. I do want to say that uh, this is part two. I don't care what you call it. I'm calling this part two because we. this is the first time in Prophet Pearls, the first time yeah. in Prophet Pearls where we actually started in a section and we get to continue in the section in, in context. And so last and week was other really... Words, it's two weeks, one after the other. Yeah. And they're they're contiguous. They're you know, but that's actually not true because we did episodes twenty two and twenty three as one episode. Yeah, we well, did that as a double header. We could have done this as a double header. There's so much in it. Oh no, okay. And also, like and listen, it's also part two for the Maccabees. They're actually two in a row. Thanks, Maccabees. You guys. Woo! <laughs> that's amazing. So Nehemi, it starts out pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, do you want to start at two four? Go for it. Hear the word of Yehovah, O house of Jacob, and all the families. Of the house of Israel. What's the difference? I don't think there's a difference. Do you think this, this is, is what just we call like biblical port- parallelism? Absolutely. It says the same thing twice. Mm-hmm. So the house of Jacob and all the families of the house of Israel. Hear uh, uh, the word of Yehovah. And then what is the word? Here it comes. Thus says Yehovah. What injustice did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and walked after emptiness and became empty? Is that is that is that that? So the word is hevel, mm-hmm. and that's the same word as um, you know, or, or uh, Ecclesiastes, where he says hevel havalim hakol hevel, vanity of vanities, all is vain. That's the mm-hmm. same word here. Mm-hmm. So they walked after vanity, which really does mean emptiness or air or breath in Hebrew, mm-hmm. um, and they were or they became hevel themselves. Okay. They walked after hevel and they became hevel. So what does it mean walking after hevel? Mm. Walking after something that doesn't matter, something that can't help you, something that's not that's not I mean, real. Yeah, imagine. it's not real. Yep. yep. So they walked, but they went after it. And isn't that isn't that the case? So, you know, we keep talking about this over and over again, yeah. where people, you know, you know, worshiping gods that are not gods, or et cetera, list, list of all these things that happen that basically someone's going after this thing that is not, it, it, it isn't anything. Mm-hmm. And they're, all, they're putting all their energy. It has no real time. substance. Yeah. They did not say, where is Yehovah? And I love whenever he, whenever Yehovah quotes this, who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Who led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of deep darkness, through a land that no one crossed and where no man dwelt. Come on, tap, tap. Yeah. Who brought us up out of the land of Egypt. Maybe you can give us three of those words. Land of Egypt or who brought us up. Oh, How many times no. do we see that? Oh, that's a ton. That's all over the place. Mm. I, I wouldn't even attempt to tap, tap for that. There's you so wouldn't. many. Okay. But I do think it's interesting, this statement. And really, we should maybe read the next two verses, and then I'll talk about that. Okay. I brought you into the fruitful land to eat its fruit and its good things, but you came and you defiled my land and my inheritance. Wow. There's that word again. You made an abomination. The priest did not say, where is Yehovah? And those who handle the law did not know me. Those who handle the Torah, I think that is. Is that true? Yes, it is. Did not know me. The rulers also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that did not prophesy. In break, there it is. Come on. Yeah. So this is interesting. He's rebuking them for not saying, "Where's God? Where's Jehovah?" Mm-hmm. You know, and, and and I think that's really interesting because I think there's this idea we have, or I don't know, I, I I've had, I grew up with, that you're not supposed to say, "Where's God?" You know, God's always there. So if something goes wrong, you shouldn't be saying. Where's God? Why has He abandoned me? Mm-hmm. But he, but they're actually being rebuked for not saying Aye Yehovah. Mm. Where is Yehovah in this? Bad things are happening. We should be saying Where is Yehovah? And it reminds me of the Psalm, uh, Psalm chapter ten. Mm-hmm. And let me read that to you. It says, Why, O Yehovah, do you stand aloof, heedless in times of trouble? And play it on the English. Why, why are you? Where are you? Who has made my legs like a deer and let me stand firm, etc.? So he's saying here, like, where are you? Bad things are happening. And, and um, you mm-hmm. know, uh, that's a different verse, actually. 
Here it says, uh, no, let me redo this now again. Here, why, O Lord, do you stand aloof, heedless in times of trouble? The wicked in his arrogance hounds the lowly. May they be caught in the schemes they devise. Where's that at? This is Psalm chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. The wicked crows about his unbridled lusts. The grasping uh, man reviles and scorns Jehovah. The wicked, arrogant as he is in all his scheming things, he does not call to account. God does not care. His ways prosper at all time. Your judgments are far beyond him. He snorts at his foes. So, you're, so what he's saying here, you know, bad things are happening. Where are you? Why are you so mm-hmm. far? Why are you standing away? Why are you hiding your face? Um, which is really interesting. And here in, in Jeremiah, they're being rebuked for not saying, where is Yehovah? You know, if something bad happens, you should be asking, okay, Yehovah is, is, is our God. He's the one who saves us, protects us. If something bad's happening, we, we should be thinking about, okay, how come he isn't protecting us? What's, what, what did we do wrong? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So... In this in this verse, the, he he goes through this and and it says here the rulers also. I see him. What okay, verse are you in? yeah, this is the second part of that verse. The rulers verse also eight? transgressed two eight. Two eight. Okay. The tr- the rulers also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied. You have the rulers, and the Hebrew says how even the shepherds, mm. the pastors. Okay. Literally the shepherds. The shepherds transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and after that which had no um, benefit, they walked. Mm. So then comes the switch. The script, the switch. Yeah. So this is where I was going to say a tap tap. It says, therefore oh. I will yet. And I was just looking at this while you were you were oh, yeah. talking about the other end. Okay. It says, therefore I will yet contend with you, declares the Lord. Would you be willing to tap tap about that? Um, what does it mean to contend? To contend? I will contend with you. I think we had a passage like this, which was like you know God wasn't it in Zechariah. Where God was calling them into judgment, mm-hmm. and He used that same word, "leave." Um, I'm pretty sure, and I think in one in one part of the verse, or in one verse there in Zechariah, it translated it in your translation as, um, "wasn't it like uh, you know indictment or something like that?" Yeah. The word was "reeve." Where yeah. was that? Well, it's funny because in Jeremiah twelve one, it says uh, in English, in the English, it's in NASB, it says, "Righteous are you, O Jehovah, that I would plead." Uh-huh. My case with you, and then the here, so it's it's Micah six two. Mm-hmm. Here you mountains, the case of Jehovah, you firm foundations of the earth. For Jehovah is a case, reeve, same word against his people. He is mm-hmm. a suit against his, against Israel, mm-hmm. a suit like these are all these legal terms. Yeah, so it was Mike, the first few verses of Micah six so, that had this legal terminology. So, so come up with a translation that would be using it that way. So therefore, I will yet. Bring and, a case against and, you. No, or enter into an argument with you. Uh-huh. And, and it's a legal argument. And, and, the, and the verse that comes to mind for this word reeve is um, Deuteronomy 17, mm-hmm. verse 8. It says, um, let's see. Uh, it says, if a case is, let me read you the King James. Mm-hmm. Just like that. If there arise a matter too hard for thee in judgment between blood and blood, between plea and plea, and between stroke and stroke, being matters of controversy within your gates. Mm-hmm. And the word controversy there is reeve. Uh-huh. So you've got to reeve with somebody. There's some argument you have with somebody, and the judges in your local city can't deal with it. Then you bring it to the temple. Mm-hmm. That's the word reeve. I have a fight with some an argument, some kind, and it's a legal contention. We've got a legitimate beef between us, um, and we need to go to court over it. So God has a reeve with us. He's got an argument, a, a legal argument against us. It's interesting. I don't want to. I don't want to go too far on this because I haven't tap tapped enough. But it's funny okay. when he says I will reeve. I think he's the only one that uses that in the Tanakh. God saying, I will read Yeah, you. that basically each of the times, I'm just looking look at this up. really quick. No, I'm actually looking at it right now. In Isaiah 49, 25, 57, 16, Jeremiah 2, 9, Jeremiah 12, 1, Nehemiah 5, 7, 13. No, 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 oh, my, wait, no, no, wait. That's no, my no. book. You can't have that one. No, no, no. no. Ne- 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 Nehemiah does do that twice. He says, I'll leave. Yes, yes, yes. I will do that. I got five times funny is that, yeah. You know what I did? I, I Isaiah actually, 49, 25, mm-hmm. 57, Isaiah 57, 16. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, Jeremiah 2, 9 and Jeremiah 12, 1. All of them have Arif twice at Jeremiah 2, 9. Mm-hmm. And I actually don't have Nehemiah. Which verse is that Nehemiah? Yeah, and actually, you know why? Is because that's actually in a different form. Ariva. Okay, yep, yep, that's yep, the, Calvary, the cohortative. Yep. Okay. Anyway, so so this is what he's saying, is that this is what he's going, mm-hmm. or this is what he's going to do with them. Uh, for cross to the crosslands of Kitim and C, and send to Kedar and observe closely and see if there has been such a thing as this. As what? Here it comes. I think this verse yeah. is so cool. <laughs> and, and actually, am I wrong? Isn't this verse quoted somewhere else? Or something like it? Has the nation changed gods when they were Didn't we have a verse recently? I thought we did. I'm trying to figure out what's... Where he asked no, that as a rhetorical no, can't, question. Can't, can't, no, he says, oh, do you not follow after gods that are not gods? And here, did a nation change his yes. God? Yes. So, 
Those are not God. There it's they started from scratch. Yeah. Okay. Hasn't it? <laughs> started from scratch no in other words they had no god to begin with they made themselves gods that were not gods yeah as a nation, they're saying they had a god and they got rid of him and got they a changed in gods and when they were not gods yeah but my look at this so first he says they've changed has a nation changed uh um gods or god it's hard a to, god you can't know in hebrew oh no it is no, 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 it's it is because it's the hema and they are not yeah 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 okay. and, and when they were not gods but my people have changed their kavod, the glory, for that which does uh, not. I, I gotta translate this from you Hebrew because do I don't know what you're doing. Yeah, okay, reading. go ahead. Yeah. Um, so it says, "Hahimir goy Elohim behemelo Elohim." Hahimir, that word means to replace, to switch mm-hmm. out. Has a nation switched out Elohim for that which is not Elohim, mm-hmm. and they are not Elohim. So they've taken on themselves a new god that wasn't. Mm-hmm. They had some mm-hmm. deity or deities. Mm-hmm. And they say, we don't want Baal anymore. We're going to take some other, other mm-hmm. god, which isn't a god. Although maybe the first god wasn't a god. And it says, but my name and my people have switched out his glory for that which cannot help or that cannot yeah, benefit. It's, it's glory. So the glory is the glory of Jehovah. Mm-hmm. But this is really a strange statement to me because the answer is, well, they, I mean, yes. I mean, yeah. So recently I was in, uh, recently, almost six months ago or so, I was in Cambodia. And they have there this temple called Angkor Wat which is the largest temple complex in the world to this day. Get out of here. It was built, yeah. I mean, this thing is many, many square miles. And um, Angkor Wat. It was built in the 12th century. And it was built as a Hindu temple. And at some point, they stopped being Hindus in Cambodia, and they replaced the Hindu gods with the Buddhist gods. And now there's statues of Buddha there, different types of Buddha, and they burn incense to Buddha, and they pray to Buddha, and literally bow down to Buddha. So I read this, and I said, well, a nation replaced... Gods with those that are not gods, and well, I mean, the answer is yes. <laughs> so I don't understand what his point is. Can you help me? <laughs> you don't understand his point. <laughs> no, what's he trying to say? Because they do do it. And, it, and it, and it does remind me of the other verse where we had this rhetorical question, and the answer was, well, yeah, they. they but isn't they the connection with the next that. verse? So in other words, if I started I, like in this situation, I always start with the end in mind. Mm-hmm. So, but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Right. Yeah. Okay. So so then so now backing into it. No, but I'm I'm still not. Yeah, it's still not working. Right. And another and here's the other verse. I just found it. The other verse that we were talking about was Jeremiah 16. Maybe this is a Jeremiah thing. Mm-hmm. Jeremiah 16, verse 20. Mm-hmm. It says, "Hayaselo adam Elohim behemalo Elohim. Shall a man make himself Elohim and they are not Elohim?" Uh-huh. Well, I mean, the answer is yes. They do do that. They do that all the time. Yeah. yeah and that's yeah, the yeah. Pro- point of the prophet. Um, and, and I think where the confusion is if there is confusion, is that normally in biblical Hebrew, when you ask a rhetorical question, mm-hmm. the answer is no. Mm-hmm. They don't do that. You know, you know, he says, Mi Yehovah. Who, is like Yehovah, uh, who is like Yehovah among the gods? And the answer is nobody. Mm-hmm. Um, they're all fake and he's real. But here the answer is, well, yeah, they do do that. Okay. Um, and maybe that's part <laughs> of Jer- Jeremiah's style. <laughs> what? Okay. What? I'm, it's funny. I'm getting a little slap happy. We're actually going to skip verse 13. Mapito. <laughs> Why do I say we're going to skip verse 13? That's my favorite. <laughs> that's, that's my ministry verse. This no, is that. the verse that inspired me for the McCoy. Can I read it in English before they do it? Because, sure. I, because I think it's really cool when we do this. Absolutely. We're not, we were never going to skip 13. But it says, Be appalled, O heavens, and 12, um, at this, and shudder and be very desolate, declares Yehovah, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain. Boy, that's a great word. Maybe this should be the word of the week. This should be the word of the week. But let's finish the verse. Of living I think water. It was the word of the week, though. To hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Okay. So okay. So it says, for two evils, my pe- literally two people evils, my people have done. They have abandoned me, makor ma'im chaim, the source of living water, mm-hmm. and that and that word makor means both a uh, source, but also a spring, because the water is a source yep. comes from the spring of water. Um. It's water that oozes out of the ground through the, mm. a crack in the aquifer. Um, the source of living water to dig for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns which cannot hold water. And the image there is is um, that a cistern is basically a, a hole in the ground. And in Israel, the the, the rock is made out of um, it's made out of a limestone, which is very porous. So when you dig yourself a cistern, you hollow out that that limestone, but then you have to cover the walls in plaster. Mm -hmm. And these things are used year in, year out for many years. In fact, I learned in archaeology that before 1948, there was no 
water piped into Jerusalem. And if you had a house without a cistern, you could have a mansion. If you didn't have a functional cistern, that mansion was worthless. You it had no value whatsoever on the market because you, that means you didn't have water that year. And, and there's very little water in Jerusalem. There is a spring called the Gihon Spring, but that, that's not enough water to sustain even the old city of Jerusalem. So basically, if you didn't have a good cistern, you were out of luck. And it's really interesting. We've, we've done this together and separately as well, gone through the uh, Western Wall tunnels, mm-hmm. which are these tunnels. You know, we've got the Western Wall, which is the remains of Herod's temple, the outer wall outside of Herod's temple of the retaining wall. Of, of this platform and you can actually continue along that wall and that's what the archaeologists did they dug underneath people's houses and as you walk along there you actually realize you're walking through cisterns mm-hmm. you see the plaster on the walls and you see the hole in the roof where people used to drop down the bucket which is mm-hmm. now covered with cement um but before 1948 when israel became a state and they uh, established uh, you know a central water system before that if you didn't have a cistern your house was had no value whatsoever because mm-hmm. in israel you need to have a cistern now, what's better than a cistern is if you have access to a spring. And why is that? Israel is on a fault line uh, between, it's what's called the Syro African Rift Valley. Mm-hmm. There are these two massive plates of the earth, the, basically the plate of Asia and, and this plate of the Africa, and they come together. Uh, in fact, some people have said that Israel is technically part of Africa based on that, which mm-hmm. it's actually true, I suppose, uh, in that respect. So the Jordan Valley and the Arava Valley. Uh, are actually what's called part of the Syro African Rift Valley. And, and there are major earthquakes in Israel about once every hundred years. The last major one was in 1929. So we're, we're due for one. <laughs> oh, um, you and, heard it here first. Yeah. And, uh, and so the point is if you have a cistern and there's an earth, a major earthquake, that cistern can crack. Mm-hmm. And if there's a crack in your cistern, all the water leaks out. It doesn't matter how much rain there is, there's no way to last you throughout the summer. Mm-hmm. So what did Israel do? What was their sin? They, they abandoned the source of eternal water, the source of living water, the makor, the spring, and instead they dug for themselves cisterns. And, and really the image here is, look, I don't need God, I can do it myself. Mm-hmm. I can make my own God, that I'll trust in my own power, that I created. That's the cistern. And he's saying, look, that's not going to help you, the cistern. You need, you need me. I'm the source of living water. Isn't that a beautiful image? Mm-hmm. Especially in a desert country like Israel, where water is such a crucial thing. And what really inspired me connected to this verse is two things. One is my sister, uh, Professor Ariella gordon Chag. I mentioned her in the last episode. She's a professor at um, Hadassah College. And uh, she lives out in the desert. And you look out from her house, and everything around 360 degrees is as dry as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. And then you go down into the valley, a five-minute walk from her house, and mm-hmm. there's a spring, a macor. Beautiful spring. And the water bubbles up out of the ground and flows into this, into this creek. And all around the creek is life for about 10 feet. Past that, the water doesn't reach and everything's dead. Mm-hmm. And boy, does that bring home to life this phrase, the source of living water. Mm-hmm. If you're in the desert... And, and Jeremiah was from the, I don't know if you know this, but mm-hmm. Jeremiah was a neighbor of my sister. Yeah. Out in, you do know that. Okay. Mm-hmm. So Anatot. We can uh, actually see his, uh, we can see, what we can we see like a, like a, a hill or something. Yeah. It's like you can well, see. Well, so he, he was from Anatot and she's from Alon, which is not far from Anatot. Um, but it's all in that same area. Oh, and, and the point is that just outside of Anatot, there is a spring and a spring runs into the valley, and it's the same the same creek we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, there's actually three springs in that that feed that creek, and he was from the upper one. She lives next to the middle one. So the, that creek that we're talking about that's fed by this this makor, this spring of water, that is the same spring that Jeremiah would have if he was going on a little prayer walk, if he was going out, uh, you know, to get spiritual with God. Then he would have gone out and he would have seen that spring. And he actually mentions that spring by name in one passage, which mm-hmm. is a different story. Yep. Anyway, so here. Um, so, so I was really inspired by seeing that. And, that, and that's the name of my ministry, Makor Hebrew Foundation, because Makor both means the spring of water, but also the source. Mm-hmm. And, um, and then what also ties into that was a statement by Martin Luther. And Martin Luther was, started, was an anti-Semite, but he actually started out, at least nominally, he loved the Jews. Mm-hmm. Um, and he famously said, he said, the Hebrew language, this is Martin Luther. And the fact that this is coming from a man who later became an anti-Semite just proves it even more. Because like he doesn't have some interest of all, I'm saying this because I'm a Judeophile. Okay. <laughs> He's saying this because it's true. The Hebrew language is the best language of all, with the richest vocabulary, said Martin Luther. If I were younger, I would want to learn this language because no one can really understand the scriptures without it. For although the New Testament, imagine that. He's saying you can't really understand the New Testament without knowing Hebrew. This is a man who translated the New Testament into English, or sorry, into German. And all later translations were based on his German translation. 
Um, even in English, they based it partly on Luther's translation. It says, because no one can really understand scripture without it. For although the New Testament is written in Greek, it is full of Hebrewisms and Hebrew expressions. It has therefore aptly been said that the Hebrews drink from the makor, the spring. Mm. The Greeks drink from the stream that flows from it and Latins from a downstream puddle. Mm. And so I read this thing in Martin Luther and I put it together with this verse here in Jeremiah chapter two, verse 13. And I said, wow, this is what we need to do. And this is what this really, this is kind of what I've been doing for years, but I realized this encapsulates exactly what I've, I've been trying to do to empower people with information, to get back to that Makor, that spring of living water. I don't want people drinking from the puddle. I don't want to feed people from the downstream stream, you know, the, the, the stream that flows from it. I want people to get back to the Makor, the source of the living water, the Hebrew words spoken by the source himself, the creator of the universe, that source of living water, and empower people with that information. And then I love the parallel. We read this, but I'll read it again. Jeremiah 17, 13. Mikveh Yisrael Yehovah. Yehovah is the hope of Israel. And that's a pun because mikveh, you know, like, the, you know, you're the that, mikveh. some people like to say, you know, the mikveh. I went to the mikveh. I was mikvahed. Um, we've talked about that. Mikveh is a, is a pool of water that actually, the original meaning was uh, a pool that's filled up by the spring. You know, the water oozes from the ground. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't fill into that, into that pool, then it just kind of dissipates and gets mm -hmm. all muddy. Um, so mikveh Yisrael, the, the, the pool of water or the hope of Israel. It's a play on words. The mik Yehovah is the mikveh Yisrael, the hope, the spring, the spring pool of water. All who, kolos vecha yevoshu, all who leave you will be dried up, but also will be ashamed. It's mm -hmm. a play on words. V'surai ba'aratz yiketevu, etc. Ki azvu mekor ma'im chayim et Yehovah. For they have left the source of living water, Yehovah. So this is my ministry, my core Hebrew foundation, to empower oh, people with information, to get them back to those Hebrew sources. And I invite you to come stand with me on the wall. My web, I'm Nehemia. My website is nehemiaswall.com. Come stand with me on the wall and get back to those sources of water. And, 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 and as you pointed out, Keith, you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. <laughs> no, I'm gonna, look, I need to get this thing back. I'm telling you, that's a golden. I need something like that for the BFA. That's so impressive. You got to get someone to do that. You want me on that wall. Hey, listen, I, I tell you something. I read that verse, uh, read that phrase of Martin Luther. It says, like you said, so it says, um, uh, if you can't all know the New, New Testament is written in Greek, it's full of Hebrews. It says, it is therefore been aptly said, Hebrews drink from the spring, Greeks from the stream that flows from it, Latin's from a downstream puddle. I'm thinking English, we got bottled water. <laughs> That's the best we can do right now. So I think we got to get away from the bottled water, go through all the process. I got to tell you something. That, you know, sometimes I'm sometimes I'm overwhelmed at the opportunities that have been presented to be able to, to, to get to that source. And and uh, certainly, you know, when, one of the things that I'm really excited about is for people being able to, to now learn some of that for themselves. I'm really excited that even now, I think we're in July at some point, maybe the third or third week of July or so. And so if you haven't gotten a chance to go through lesson one, you, you haven't missed it. It's a we're putting out one, one, one about one per week. But the thing is, is that it gives you a chance to take your time on your own time to learn what I call um, step by step, bite by bite, a little bit of Hebrew, um, just so you can learn it. And then as we go, as we progress, we'll get into some of the tools. But right now, I would invite people to go to BFAinternational.com. There's so much that's there. Uh, there's new teachings that we constantly have going up. 50 some high quality HD quality presentations that have, some of them have been on primetime and Christian television and other places. Of course, you can be a registered member and you got access to a whole bunch. And of course, you could even go to the site with nothing and be blessed with over 100 different resources that are there. So go to BFAinternational.com. We really, really appreciate those of you that are in the premium content library because you're helping us develop um, this this Hebrew course. And, and we've gotten input from people for the last couple years but this is really a special time during the summer where we can get your input and we're going to present this so that by the time we get done with profit pearls you know what's, this is what i'm hoping to come in by the time we get done with profit pearls this cycle of profit pearls when you go through it again you may be able to go to a next step and you know Nehemiah does a really powerful thing because we'll be going through profit pearls and i've got my niv and my nasb and my hebrew bible and all this stuff and that's just to make sure he doesn't throw a curveball at us and try to try to try to put something over us no he doesn't do that he gives us the opportunity to get to the makor to the source but how wonderful it would be for people to also be able to track them later and when there is an issue that's brought up the word of the week or something like that there actually could be the ability for them to look and see that information for themselves so yeah. hey and one more thing Nehemiah, that i really do yeah. appreciate Folks, if you haven't gotten a chance to do this, it really would be a blessing to you. Go to NehemiahsWall.com, BFAInternational.com. And on the post of Prophet Pearls, just below, there is a post where you actually can hear the passage itself, the entire passage mm -hmm. in Hebrew. Yeah. Nehemiah does that. And um, 
We appreciate you for that. So again, BFAInternational.com, inspiring people around the world to, say it, build a biblical foundation for their faith. Let's continue, Nehemia. Can I ask us to, you know, I mean, we, there's so much to talk about here. Just one it, thing before you say we're going to skip. Just well, one thing I want to ask. Well, I want to tap, tap. Well, it's a quick tap, tap. Yeah. Okay. Je- Jeremiah 2.14 says, it says, uh, this, okay, now here's what it says in English. It says, is yeah. Israel a slave? Question mark. Or is he a home-born servant? And that completely confuses me when I hear that in English. Hmm. And I want to ask the question, do you see that that is a question, the first phrase? Do you see that as a question? Well, it definitely is a question because we have what's called the interrogative hey. Yeah. The hey means the in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's also a hey that doesn't mean the, that's a question. Mm -hmm. So that's what we have before the Evid. Yeah. Yes. So there's the question mark. But then it says, um, it says, or is he a homeborn, in English it says, or is he a homeborn servant? And I see the word... um, uh, Yelid, Yelid. yeah, a child of the house or child. Yeah, what would you, what it's would you say? Not clear that that necessarily means a servant. Yeah, um, but it could be a servant who's born at home. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, you're not excited about that. I'm so, anyways, and why has he become a prey now? You said you were going to maybe skip ahead. What, what do you see? Talk to me. Oh, I mean, there's so much to talk about here, but I want to talk about verse 18. Okay. And a bunch good. of other verses. If we don't skip, we won't. Well, there's the deal. Stuff. The only way we're going to do that is if we tell people homework. This homework. <laughs> Make sure that you got to read. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. All right, so verse, can you read verse 18? Yes, but now what are you doing on the road to Egypt? To drink the waters of the Nile? Or what are you doing on the road to Assyria? To drink the waters of the Euphrates? And, and isn't that great? He says, I'm the source of living water. I'm the spring. And, and you want to go to these rivers and drink. Don't, don't go drinking from some other stream, some other river. I'm the source of living water. Isn't that awesome? He's, another, he's in this. It's still Isn't that a powerful spirit. image? It's oh. in the spirit. It's in the spirit. Oh, we're we're, yes, we're yes, continuing yes. That, that metaphor of Jehovah is the water. Mm-hmm. You know, and again, we're, we're here in Israel, which is a desert country, and that's such a powerful image. And you might think, oh, I don't need a cistern because Egypt, that, you know, the, the, the Nile is, is an unusual type of river. I mean, unusual for this part of the world. Mm-hmm. And that it never stops flowing. It's not a, you know, most of the rivers we have in Israel are seasonal creeks. Um, and the, the Nile is just this, you know, never ending source of water. Euphrates is the same sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jehovah is saying, Hey, don't, don't go to those. I'm the sor- I'm your source of water. Amen. Amen. That's beautiful. Next thing I want to talk about is in verse 20, unless you got something. In verse 20 is good. I like that one. For yeah. long ago, I broke your yoke and tore off your bonds, but mm-hmm. you said, I will not serve for on every hill and under every green tree you have laid down as a harlot. Boy, that's controversy. Ooh. Yeah. So I will not serve as what you have in verse 20. Mm-hmm. What does it say in the Hebrew? Let's see in 2020. Hold on. Jeremiah 2.20. That's interesting. Um, it's, it, uh, that's very interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, Jeremiah, or JPS says, I will not work. Mm-hmm. Um, King James says, I will not, um, and now says, I will not transgress. Mm-hmm. Um, what does it actually say? So I will not transgress is actually what it says in the Hebrew, kind of. <laughs> I will not. It's serve. got an interesting little thing going on. So this on is here. what we call in Hebrew creek teeth. Yeah. Now <laughs> I'm just going to give people a little taste of this. This, this is, is important. This is a huge topic. It's a very important topic. There are certain words in the Hebrew manuscript that, in the margin of the manuscript, it says to read differently than the way they're written. Mm-hmm. And sometimes this has to do with what we call euphemisms. That is a word that they felt couldn't be read in the synagogue because it was maybe a dirty word um, or a frightening word. Um, But most of them aren't that. Most of them aren't issues of euphemism. Most of them are corrections. And what happened is we're told that in the Second Temple times, there were three manuscripts of Scripture in the uh, the temple courtyard. They're Mm -hmm. called the Temple Courtyard Manuscripts or the Sifle HaAzara. And what they would do is they would line up the three manuscripts side by side and compare them. Yes. And... When there was a difference, they would say, we're going to take two out of three. And there was actually an entire guild of, um, of scribes who were called the Temple Courtyard Proofreaders. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole discussion in, in the early ra- writings of the rabbis about the, these Temple Courtyard Proofreaders who paid their salary. Maybe it came out of certain sacrifices because they worked for the temple. There's a whole discussion about that. But we can actually see some of the things they did here. Mm-hmm. And what am I talking about? So in the body of the Hebrew text... It says, lo e'evod, I will not work. And in the margin, it says, read it, not e'evod, 
work, and but at Evor, yes. I will transgress or literally pass over, but mm-hmm. have to transgress. Um, and certainly uh, Jewish sources have accepted that the marginal reading is the way we're supposed to understand it, mm-hmm. because that was apparently based on the majority reading, or it was a correction sometimes for an error. And, and sometimes you get to a place where the reading in the body of the text makes no sense whatsoever, and it's corrected in the margin. In this case, actually, both readings make sense. Mm-hmm. And we call this the Cree Kativ. Cree is spelled kind of weird. Mm-hmm. It's spelled Q-E-R-E in English. In Hebrew, it's easy. Kufre mm-hmm. shud. And the Kativ is K-E-T-I-V. Go, that's homework. Go look up Cree Kativ, K-E-R-E and K, uh, sorry, Q-E-R-E and K-E-T-I-V. And it's actually a whole huge topic, the Cree Kativ. And where it becomes important... Uh, I mean, it's always important, but where it becomes particularly interesting for me is where we get to the name yud heh where many scholars will come along and say, oh, that's a Kri Kativ too. And the marginal reading is Adonai, and the body of the text is Yehovah, except there it's a little different because the marginal reading never says Adonai. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so th- there they're inserting something in the margin based on their own speculation. Mm-hmm. Here it's actually in the margin of the Hebrew manuscript that says read it, transgress, not work. You know, it's an interesting. I, I I just did something real quick while you were waxing on. Yeah. And, and, uh, <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> By the way, just, just no. so people understand, the King James has the marginal reading. Oh, no, no, I'm looking. Most that's the translation what I, no, have. Hold the, on. Uh, no, yeah. no, I, no you, you can't steal that. No, look. Oh, so here, what here's what I did is I took three translations. Yeah. And this is what really what I appreciate you about you bringing this up, Nehemiah. Yeah. Here's an example where someone can actually do this with no Hebrew. Mm-hmm. All you've got is the NASB, the JPS, and the KJV. And so the NASB says. I will not work. I will not serve. I'm sorry. In the K, in, a, uh, in the JPS, it says I will not work, and in the KJV, it says I will not transgress. And so, mm-hmm. if we were like those guys back with those three manuscripts, mm-hmm. we'd say what? Two win and one goes. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny they don't take That's like, what they would like the text text criticism sort of approaches. You know, you, the, the more difficult reading sometimes you would say. That's and, and I think there's some truth to that. Yeah, but here the issue is something very straightforward. The the body of the text has a dalad and the margin has a resh. Yeah. And what's the difference between dalad and resh? Actually, in two different, a tiny little bump. <laughs> yeah. And that's both in Second Temple script and in the original Paleo script. Mm-hmm. It's the difference between, a, uh, um, you know, really a little bump is the difference mm-hmm. between dalad and resh. And here, clearly, in one of the manuscripts, it had dalad, and another one, it had resh. And the third one, that's a question. It probably in the third one it had the resh. And so they wrote in the margin, Rache, read it like this. Mm -hmm. But they didn't dare change it completely. They said, look, and this is actually something you see in some of the writings. They say, when Elijah comes and says, why did you change it? We'll be able to say there, we didn't change it. You know, (laughs) the text still reads the way Uh it reads. But for the purposes of interpretation, we believe this is how it should read based on the majority reading. Mm. But we dare not change it. Mm. Isn't that amazing? Man. Well, again, folks, this is a chance for you to get a chance to see this, just to see it with your own two eyes. It really is kind of phenomenal. And, you know, when it comes to the Word of God, you know, yeah. why not go through the process of right. having to dig and, and search right. and check and, and, and go back yeah. and forth? It really is exciting to do that. Yeah. And here's what's, what's really exciting to me is to see this subtle difference, which in Hebrew is a difference between a little bump. And then I'll, I'll, I'll encounter people who say, you know, the Jewish scribes, they falsified the text. They changed it. Originally, it said this. And this is always their pet doctrine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say, wait a minute. When the scribes did something, they told us exactly what they did. Yeah. They, they, they showed they their work. Exactly. They showed their homework. They indicated what they were doing. Oh, man. I mean, they left no doubt whatsoever about what yeah. they were doing. So to come along and say, oh, there's this Jewish conspiracy by the scribes to falsify something in Scripture. Well, no. They, they, they were obsessing about whether there was a little bump on this letter or not. Uh. And, and they were so meticulous that they left, you, they left the traces. They said, look. It says this in these manuscripts, but this in this manuscript. We're going to give you both. You know, I got to tell you something, folks, as you're listening to this. One of the things that I did in the, initially, when I always go back to history, just because, you know, you and I were sitting across me on, on the wall, uh, the Western Wall, uh, a few days ago. And I said, let's yeah. go back to the spot where, where I asked you this question about the name. But beyond that, I, I, I asked you something else. And, and that was that when I first came and said, Nehemia, you listen, I need you to help me have access. So we're, you're going to be friends. You're going to teach me how to read my Torah scroll, which has no vowels. Uh, well, I shouldn't say it. there's no vowel markers. It, it, there are vowels in it. <laughs> in it. But um, but I, I asked you that and you said, no, I won't. And we went back and forth. But when we finally agreed um, to do this, I said I wanted to know four things. I said I wanted to know something about consonants, vowels, accents, and Masoretic notes. And I got to give you, I just got to give you some credit because 
as we were going through that, you know, there was a whole course, Nehemiah. I don't know why you, it was a whole course, folks. But the really cool thing about it is getting the access to that information and then going and seeing if this is the Bible that I believe this is the word of God. To, to go, it's like going back in history. It's like you're sitting down with the scribe who says, here, we saw this and we changed it to that. And here's why. Like, that's the part to me that's just so amazing is that people could actually like you can actually go through and, and feel like you're a thousand years or two thousand years or whatever it was ago when that actually took place. So that's all I have to say about that. Yeah. Um, Probably about two thousand years ago. Yeah. Temple so, Court and Manuscripts. All right. Yeah. Can, can we talk about the phrase, um, I broke your yoke, I, yoke, I snapped your cords? Is Absolutely. You, do you have that? No, let's see here. Uh, I, I tore off your bonds. Oh. Okay. I broke your yoke is there. Oh, okay. But, but, and I tore it says, off I your broke bonds. your yoke, I snapped your cords. That's a literal translation. And I love that image mm-hmm. because some people will say, oh, the Torah, it's this burden. It's so. T-. In fact, there's this phrase in, in Jewish tradition that refers to the yoke of the Torah. Mm-hmm. Literally, they'll use that word, the yoke, like which is like. And, and here's the image: there's an ox, and he has this yoke around his neck, and there's little cords that you mm-hmm. t- attach the um, the plow to. It's a very heavy burden. Mm-hmm. And here he's saying, "I broke." Yehovah is saying to Israel, "I broke your yoke. I snapped your cords." The Torah is not a burden; it's freedom. Mm-hmm. God removed the yoke and ropes, but we refuse to move forward in the freedom of Torah. That's mm-hmm. what the pro- what's happening here in this prophecy. Mm-hmm. We stayed in the bondage of superstition and tradition. Offering sacrifices at the high place. Okay. That, that's what it's talking now, about. I'd like you passage. to let everybody off the hook if you can because you, yeah. you love to do this. So when it says, and, and these people were on every high hill and under yeah. every green tree. Yeah. Um, when you hear the, when you see this word, every, every, every tree that is uh, <laughs> green. Uh, you know, for somebody that reads that and says, yeah. you know, they were worshiping under the tree and they, they were on the high hill. You know, we've talked about the, the you know. All these other issues, but as it pertains to the green tree, what, you know, what's your image? What's your, you're in Israel. Oh, it, so what is? I don't even need to imagine what it is. You don't. <laughs> Here's the beauty. So you go around Israel, and Israel doesn't have a lot of trees. Right. We're, we're not like you know. I, I was recently in North Carolina. Oh, man. in fact, I have a really good friend in Tennessee. Hey, Eddie, and he has a job cutting down trees, mm-hmm. and the trees grow back so fast. You know, it, it's like he has never. There's no end to his work cutting down trees. And, you know, and he makes the, he remarked to me once, he said, you know, look, everyone's talking about deforestation, how it's this, you know, global problem. He says, I've got more trees than I can cut. And, mm-hmm. and, and it's actually specifically in certain safety situations, like if you have a, a gas pipeline and there's trees growing, the roots are there, they can actually, people can die, it can explode and, and you know, blow mm-hmm. up. And um, if you don't get rid of those trees within a certain proximity of the gas pipeline, or for example, at an um, airport. Mm-hmm. And Israel's not like that. <laughs> in Israel, we don't have a lot of trees. Um, and you travel around and you see these trees that are ancient trees. We actually saw one together, an ancient tree. And mm-hmm. you'll often find the ancient trees to this very day. And I'm talking about trees that are easily a thousand, sometimes 2000 years old, maybe more. They're these giant trees that spread out and they have leaf, they're leafy green trees. And they often will have, a, a the tomb of a, of a Muslim Sheikh next mm-hmm. to it, another mm-hmm. Muslim mm-hmm. holy man. Um, and what happened is the, the Muslims, the Arabs, they would cut down every tree they could except for those sacred trees. And some of those sacred trees may be thousands of years old. And why mm-hmm. do I say that? Because if you read about the, the Muslim tradition, the Arab tradition about those trees, they believe the trees were inhabited with goddesses. They called them spirits. Spirits. And they called those spirits the daughters of Israel, interesting, mm-hmm. or the daughters of Jacob. Um, and, appa- and what that shows you is these are ancient traditions, probably going back to the Israelites who worshipped goddesses that they believed lived in these trees. Mm-hmm. Um, so you actually see these trees all over the country. They're still around. Mm-hmm. And they're still worshipped by some of the local mm-hmm. um, inhabitants. So isn't that something? So you and, can read the verse. Yeah. You can read the verse. And then I, in my mind, of course, I And I can go to a hillside not far I can from see here it. and I can see it. And you can see it. And, and here's the really tragic thing to me. Some of these sacred trees were worshipped by the ancient Israelites. The, uh, the Arabs came along, replaced the, you know, drove out the Jews and continued to worship the same trees. And today there are Jews who have gone back and worship at these trees again. They call them the tombs of the of great rabbis. Of, of, they call them Kivrei Tzadikim, the tombs of the, of the righteous saints, uh, referring to dead rabbis. Who, and, you know, there was a, and now they say that tomb that was supposed to be of a Muslim sheikh, they said, no, that's actually such and such a rabbi. And so, and actually, some of the same rituals surrounding those trees continue to be practiced. Certain kinds of offerings. Yeah, it's funny you said it's that. It's unbelievable. About that, how, two thousand years later, two thousand years later, you, we no have actually been to places where you can see. You now, the Muslims will say, "No, that's Sheikh So and So," and then someone else will say, "No, that's Rabbi So and So." Right. Yeah. Right. right. And there's actually one spot not far from here where there's one place 
where the, both the, the Christians, the Jews, and the Muslims all say that there is a, a woman buried in the tomb. Mm-hmm. The Jews say it's Hulda the prophetess, yep. who was mentioned in the Book of Kings. Come on. The Muslims say it's you know some Muslim saint who I've never heard of, but a woman. And the Christians say it's some you know some woman who was martyred by the Romans. You know she's a saint. And isn't it interesting? All three of them knows a woman buried there. But they, um, but they disagree about what woman, and all three of them will come and pray there at that grave. Isn't that something? And, and the point is that these leafy trees, they were uh, practiced before the Torah was written, and they continue to do it. Wow, nothing's changed. And then here's the here's the here's the. So how am I letting people off the hook with that? What was, no, no, what no, was no, 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 no. I was I you thought you were gonna me. I thought you were gonna. It, it's okay. It's fine. We're good. Uh, yet, <laughs> I planted you a I choice said. vine, yeah. a completely faithful seed. It says. Yeah. How then have you turned yourself before me? Into the generous sh- shoots of okay. Here's the point, Nehemiah. Yeah. What's your so point? these people who who, who sometimes take the the worship of and you know you you don't believe that this is the case because it wasn't in your background. But there are some people that get around the time of, the, of winter. Oh, you're going to tie us to the Christmas tree. Go ahead. And they get around this time of this this time of winter, and and and, and it ends up being this sort of focus for worship. I mean, when I say this, literally, there are some people that, as it pertains to their tree, their their actual tree that they bring into their house. And then and they set up and they and they put it up and they, and they dangle it with all that stuff on there. It, it, it's like for some people, and, and I know there's people here that are listening that understand this because I actually have a, 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 a connection to this. Where where the people would say, "Don't touch the tree, don't don't you know the the tree's holy. It's it's kadosh kadosh kadosh." Let's the Christmas set it. tree. No, I'm telling you. They would say, the and Christmas I'm telling tree you, is holy, don't that, touch don't, it. And I'm telling you that that, that it's it, it, in in some ways. There is a, you know, you want to always let people off the hook. No, it's not. The, I'm it, not letting them off the no, hook. No, 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 but I'm just telling you it's, it's a different, it's a different language and context. I understand, and but I've got this agenda about. No, it's not an agenda. Christmas. It's not an Look, agenda. Everybody listening to this right now on December 24th, meet Keith Johnson with your axe at Rockefeller Center. Is that- <laughs> no, let's cut it down. <laughs> no, just watch now. Hashtag, Hashtag, let's cut it let's down. Let's cut it down. <laughs> No, I've gotten in trouble about this. And I, and I certainly know that that's not the case for everyone. And there are people listening that that's not the case, that they don't treat it that way. But there are people, honestly, Nehemiah, that actually, and I'm not saying that this tree is that tree, but I'm saying what's under it, what's behind it, how people treat it, you know, I, it's not far from my mind to be able to look in a hill yeah. and to see what people do and to see what I see in, 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 in many places. It really is, um, it's scary. Hashtag, let's cut it down. <laughs> let's cut it down. You would want me on that wall. You, you need me on that wall. Wait so anyway, um, how, how far do you want to go here? Because here's... Look, we got to skip to the end because we're running out of time. Can we go to verse 27, please? Uh, no, if you got something else, let's talk about it. But otherwise, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting for you at verse 27. Go ahead. Say what you need to say. Hey, folks, do me a favor. Look at verse 22 and think about what it was like when you had to wash your mouth out with soap. Oh, uh, Let's move on. Go ahead. 27. Okay, those who say to the to the to the tree, "You are my father," and to the stone, "You, you gave, gave birth, birth to me," for they have turned back their necks, they have turned their the back of their neck to to me and not their face. Uh, in the time of their trouble, they say, "Arise and save us." Yeah. <laughs> so when things are where things are good, they're going and worshiping trees and stone mm-hmm, and saying, mm-hmm. "Oh, that's my father in heaven. Mm-hmm. Oh, our heavenly father." Speaking to some wood or some stone. But when things go bad, then all of a sudden it's, arise and save us. I love that. And that's the word, save us. Yeah. Hoshienu. But where are your gods, which you made for yourself? Let mm-hmm. them arise. If they can save you in the time of, you know, God really, like, he really. There's irony. Lays it out. Yeah. You, know, you know, he just, he like lays it out there. Are your gods. Let them save you. Have you not just now called to me, my father? You are the friend of my... Oh, he's a friend of my youth. And now, hold on, you guys. Here's another problem. I got a big problem. Friend of your youth. No, no. Let me tell you what happens. Where's that? 228, yeah. it ends. And then yeah. it's my understanding that we're supposed to go to one verse. Yeah. Three verse four. I'm going to protest. Okay. I'm not going to the verse. Okay. We're skipping that one. Let me just end verse 28. Ki mispararecha hayu elohecha, Yehuda. For the numbers of your cities were your gods, O Judah. In other words, every city had its own deity. That's a, As many cities as they had, that's how many gods they had. Mm. And I'll tell you, for me, this was a really important verse when I was studying archaeology. Because I had something where the professors presented us with some information to destroy our faith. Mm-hmm. Do you know they do that in universities? Absolutely. And they said, you know, we've got this image that in biblical times they were monotheists, but they weren't. They worshipped many gods. And look at the archaeological ruins, the remains, and they would show us these... These, these photographs, and, and we actually went to see the actual artifacts of 
countless little um, figurines, like little gods mm-hmm. that were found, mm-hmm. gods and goddesses that were found in the city of David in the ex- archaeological excavations. And their point was, forget your Jewish fantasy that our ancestors were monotheists. They were polytheists. They had many gods and worship statues. The, the, and I, and they I don't, don't read this. And, I mean, and, I, and look, my, when I first heard this, I, I said, oh, 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 wait a minute. What, what's, I was a little nervous. And then I remembered this verse and I said, wait a minute, this proves what Jeremiah said. <laughs> the numbers of your cities, number of your cities was the number of your gods, O Judah. So wait a minute, how does this undermine my faith? No, this no. actually proves that what Jeremiah was talking And this is from the period of Jeremiah in these archaeological excavations in the city of David. So I'm like, wait a minute. So Jeremiah knew what he was talking about. Read the book, 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 read the book. Keep reading. <laughs> okay, my friend. Uh, hey, you know what? Here's what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to say a prayer and... Um, Boy, hey, really, there's a challenge, you guys. We, we skipped a lot of verses. I feel bad about it, but we just can't. We can't go verse by verse by verse. And boy, wait until you see what's coming. I, I don't know how we're going to. It's too important. Oh, I'll just read it real quick. For, hello, meata, karatli avi. From now, you will you not call me my father? Aluf nu'ayata. You are the mighty one, the captain, the chief of my youth. And, and I love that there because the word aluf, which means mighty one. And that's connected to the word avi, av, father. That's the word of the week, avi, alf, bet, yud. Look it up. No, look it up. No, that's the word of the week, alf, bet, or alf, bet, yud, my father. And I know there are some people who say, oh, alf, bet, father. It's the aluf, the aleph, which means the bull, and the bet, the house. But actually, you don't need the word pictures to connect father and aluf, mighty one. It's right there, Jeremiah 3, 4. Look it up for yourselves. Well, he snuck that one in, folks. Uh, Now for your prayer. Now for the prayer. Father, thank you that you are our real father. You are the one who was, is, and shall be. And uh, man, being a father, knowing how much I love my my sons, and then thinking about how much you love all creation, I just can't even fathom how amazing you are. Uh, Give us uh, perspective, and give us wisdom, and give us desire, and hope, and all the things that we need to continue to to put all the pieces together to figure out what your word says for us and your will and, and how to walk in your way. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For more information, please visit nehemiaswall.com and bfainternational.com.